So, good morning. Um, my name is Philip Morris. I'm what's called the External Partnerships Manager at the, this university, at the University of York. And I work principally, or almost predominantly, almost exclusively, with the arts and the humanities departments. And what I'd really quite like to do today is, in the very brief time that I've got, is to give you a little um, overview of the heritage sector and then provide you with a sort of rich cameo of the type of activities that are going on this, in this university that I think can be used to support the, the heritage sector within the digital heritage perspectives. Um, but I'd also like to apologise uh, profoundly. I can only stay here for a very short time. We have a similar event going on in the Humanities Research Centre. Having looked at the agenda for today's activities, um, I would very much like to have stayed and been able to engage in conversations with a lot of you. And so for that, I must offer my apologies. The heritage sector, um, unlike the rest of the UK economy, is, um, is, is bucking the trend. Last year, um, the English heritage visitors rose by some 14% um, to something like 5.4 million. And within the National Trust, the visitors' trend was even better. The National Trust visitors rose by some 18% to around about 14 million visitors. That's significant improvement on the previous year's, uh, rec uh, previous year's numbers. And it's an indication of the interest that there is within the heritage sector. The heritage sector roughly generates about 12.4 billion pounds a year of direct income and of indirect income it's round about give or take 21 billion pounds a year it's not an insignificant sector at all um, about 113,000 people directly employed by the heritage sector and around about 157 indirectly employed so it's quite a significant chunk of people working within the heritage sector what I want to sort of look at is the digital heritage, the collision, if you like, of digital technologies within, with the heritage sector, and the way in which the digital heritage can be used to help develop the heritage sector. Develop in a number of different ways, not only as more people go to visit various heritage sites, do we need to think harder about the preservation of these sites, but we also need to sort of promote accessibility so that somebody in San Francisco who's potentially thinking of visiting York as a tourist, or visiting anywhere as a tourist, might be able to see and understand better the types of heritage artefacts that there are within York or within whichever place you wish to choose. There's something also about marketing as well, again from the tourist perspective. I mean, heritage is an integrally linked to tourism. A large proportion of the tourists that come to this country come to this country not You'll be surprised to hear because of our weather, wonderful though it is, but it is, it is to do with our heritage. Um, and finally, there's something about pedagogy and education um, that digital heritage, digital, her digital technologies can bring to the heritage sector. So that's the sort of a context in which the university plays itself. It's sort of working within those areas of things like preservation, accessibility, marketing, pedagogy, and so on. So what I want to do is just very quickly run through the types of things that we're doing at, at the university. So I'm not going to talk about the technical aspects. I mean, I think John gave a very... I just caught the end of John's speech from Cybula and the types of work that Cybula is doing within, within the technology sector, within the university but also more generally within the computer science and the electronics departments. There are all sorts of technical issues that are being addressed. I can't talk about any of them in any detail. I can't even spell open source, so I don't think you're going to get a very lucid account from me about what sort of issues are within data mining, data storage, and so on. But you can see that from the sort of very highly rated research departments that we've got within the university, we are tackling a large number of research issues within those within those particular areas. The heritage has got sort of, it's, it's all digital heritage, it's very loosely defined in a way, and it can cover a whole range of different activities. I mean, we would use the word heritage to sort of cover everything from cinema, sound. We've had a sort of presentation this morning on, 
on sound, which I think has also emerged from the, from the university. Churches, archaeology, and, and heritage sites. And you can probably add to that list as well to sort of show the wide spectrum of application domains that digital heritage can be applied to. I think one thing that's also quite important, and it's also quite a nice story actually, is that people think of heritage as being somehow linked inextricably with something that happened either just before or just after the Vikings arrived. But, but that's, that's not the case. I mean, people like English Heritage and National Trust are interested in a whole range of potential heritage sites. And one of the more charming uh, activities we had recently at the university was the head of the archaeology department was asked to go and look at the flat that was occupied by the Sex Pistols during their most prolific period. Prolific can be understood any way you like there. And to report back on whether it was thought that the flat should be preserved by English heritage or not. And so um, a great deal of photographs were taken of things that were scrawled on the wall in the flat, none of which I could present at this presentation. <laughs> they are strong stuff, I tell you. Um, so um, the, the, the point of this sort of anecdote is really just to sort of let you know that you shouldn't really just assign heritage with something that happened in 344 BC or AD or whatever. There's something... Heritage has got lots of digital technology. Digital heritage has got a lot to do with knowledge. It's got to do with the preservation of knowledge. These things, these artifacts, these flats in Kensal Rise, um, all need preserving, and they can be preserved as the actual objects as well. But it's also useful to have a preservation of, in a digital format, which will enable accessibility to be enhanced to these types of places but it will also enable the original to sort of be preserved and, and cherished for future generations to see the language that Johnny Rotten relished and enjoyed so much. It's also got a lot to do with pedagogy, with teaching, that it's through having some sort of digitised versions of these artefacts and exciting environments in which, to, in which to portray these, like the 360 downstairs, that helps to sort of encourage interest in the... In, 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 in the past and in the history and in, in our heritage. And it's also got something to do with about dissemination and improving the marketing opportunities for, for these heritage sites. So I think that digital heritage plays an important part in our economy for a number of different reasons. Um, Final, uh, no, penultimate slide is that there are a number of activities that are going on in the university. We have, as I sort of from my first slide indicated, got a range of people interested in, in digital heritage from a number of very many different departments from electronics, computer science, archaeology, history, sociology, the list goes on. And so we've set up in York, recently set up in York, a centre for digital heritage. And one of the purposes of that centre, but not the only purpose of the centre, is to try and bring together the computer scientists with the historians to get them to be able to communicate more effectively with each other, to get them to better understand the way in which they can exploit both the sort of the end user's perspective but also from the technological perspective as well. That sort of collaboration is important and I think that will help to enhance the opportunities. We're obviously involved in a number of research and development projects and all sorts of funding opportunities. Um, we also organise various conferences in digital heritage. We have commercial activities. I'm going to just give you a very quick example of one as my last slide. Um, we do consultancy. Johnny Rotten was an example of that. And we also are engaged in a number of regional, national and international activities. So there's a wealth of stuff going on at the university around the digital heritage. Let me just finish with this. I love this story, actually. It's... Um, I don't really know what this story tells us, but it tells us something which I think is profound, but I can't quite put my finger on what it is at the moment. That within the history department, we have a very strong medieval history department at the University of York. And we have within that medi within the history department two ladies, both of whom are medieval historians, and both of whom were alarmed and scandalised by the lack of understanding that students were displaying about various sort of Christian iconography and about culture. They would use, for example, words such as annunciation in a lecture 
and nobody understood what the word enunciation meant. So what they did was they put together a, a, a DVD that actually was just, if you like, a glossary of this terminology. But it wasn't just a glossary, it was also pictures such as the Fra Angelico that you can see there to help to illustrate what the word enunciation meant. And then they built on this by actually getting sort of research cameos and putting the sort of, in a digestible form, an explanation of what these words meant and what the current understandings of these words meant. And they started to take these DVDs to conferences and to flog them. And over a period of about three to four years, they've now sold something like 14,000 of these DVDs at about 15 quid a pop. So you can see, for two medieval historians who knew very little about technology, that was really quite interesting. And it's completely changed the way in which they now work. They now no longer have to worry about undergraduates not understanding iconography and various languages, because they're now working purely on these sort of um, commercial uh, activities. They've been developing CD-ROMs and DVD-ROMs. They have a number of these now out and have been marketing both here and in the States and in Europe. They've been involved in, in interpreting buildings. A lot of churches are very concerned about um, people's understanding of the churches. So what they've been doing is putting these enormous plasma screens which sort of detract from, from how one might expect a 14th century church to look. And so initially that they started off working with, with these churches and helping them to try and provide a guide for interpreting the church that wasn't too offensive to those who wanted to use the church perhaps for, for religious purposes. They also started to develop training courses as well for a lot of the clergy. A lot of the clergy um, clearly very able from a sort of um, uh, Christian point of view, I suppose, but not so knowledgeable about what they've actually got in their church. They perhaps don't know the difference between a Romanesque arch and a Gothic arch. I don't know, choose your own examples. And so they then started to provide tra training courses to the Church of England. But what's happened more recently, well, like perhaps over the last 12 to 15 months, is that they've got involved in the app market, a market that um, some people in the university were a little suspicious of and thought would not do terribly well. But they started to produce apps for churches. This is all generated. Am I going on too long here? <laughs> this is a lovely story. This was all generated from the Holy Trinity Church in Stratford-upon-Avon, where Shakespeare is buried. And what was happening is loads of European kids are coming, and English kids, and they're just sitting on the floor looking at their iPhones. They don't give a toss about, about the church or anything like that. So the church wondered, well, so if they developed an app, might this get the kids interested in, in the heritage of that church? And so they asked CNC, Christianity and Culture, to develop an app, which they've now done, which you can now download. I think it's free. And um, that sort of completely reinvigorated interest by people under the age of 25 within the church. They're now looking at their apps and then wondering about the church and starting to look at what's in the church. But the, sort of, the, the important point from this is that there's been a sort of burgeoning effect that other churches have got to, got to hear about this. And now they have a serious problem because the demand is just outstripping supply. They are just growing so fast in just developing an app for this church, that church, the other church, that it's just an amazing development, an amazing trajectory that they have been on over the last five years. And these are two women who are medieval historians and that's the effect that digital heritage has had on them and their lives and on our lives. Sorry, I've gone on far too long. Right.